Hello, welcome to another episode of The High Ground, powered by Premier Companies. Jeff, how are you today? I'm doing great, Sal. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. What are we going to talk about? Well, we got a special guest on. He's a regular guest, Aaron Bledsoe, and uh, been here with us many times before. And uh, But Aaron, before we get started, there's the question of the day. Oh, no. I forgot to check the question of the day. Well, just check your phone and see what the wallpaper is, because that's going to be what the oh, question easy. of the day is. Tell us, Aaron, tell us about the wallpaper that's on your phone right now. That's your screensaver for us older folks. Uh, what do you have on there for a screensaver, and is there a story behind it? Yeah, so the lock screen on my phone is a picture of my daughter, and she's in her little camo outfit. Um, it's our one of our very first times we went hunting together, just her and I. So, no dead animals in the picture. No. So you, I mean, there's there's nothing offensive uh, in the picture. It's Is just, that because it's you're just a poor her hunter? Being super cute. <laughs> it, you know, I'm starting to feel that way. I'm starting to feel that <laughs> way because anytime that I way. take her, we do we do not have good luck at all. I mean, <laughs> we've been going two years now, and we haven't killed anything together. So. Daddy's not looking very good. <laughs> not looking very good at all. Gosh. Are you on your phone now? Can you show us the picture? Uh, I'm on my iPad, but I can I can show you. Yeah, give me one second. Me... This will be good. Yeah, there you go. Oh, Let's that's adorable. That is adorable. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Well, Little it's... sweetheart. I bet Jeff's got cattle or something on his. What's on you yours? Know, it, it's usually grandkids or or cows or something like it. but technically right now it is a blank blue screen. it is it's I, so yeah I, i've let you down so did you break it I, no i had something on there and then i i was doing some kind of reset and yeah it you have to have one of your kids fix it for but you it, yeah i'll get the kids or the grandkids to fix it <laughs> well mine uh <laughs> my little girl grabbed my phone and she's got it um where it rotates through pictures on an iPhone, I guess it'll, you can pick like 50 pictures. Oh, so it, they're constantly changing. Yep. Every time your phone locks or every time it open it up, it comes to another picture. I did not know that. Yep. So I've got some, my parents are on there and <laughs> one and her and my wife and uh, pretty neat. That time, every, every time you pick it up. But if I had a cute picture like that one though, Aaron, I'd just leave it on there. Yeah. She's way too cute for me. <laughs> I mean, she, she does, she does look like her mother. <laughs> that was obvious. Okay. <laughs> we weren't going to state the obvious, but uh, yeah, we'll have you back for hey, a podcast when I've she gets a dating face age. for radio. <laughs> face for radio. <laughs> if you, I don't know if you heard me. We'll have you back for a podcast when she gets of dating age, and we'll oh, take your temperature gosh. then. That's not funny for all of us with girls. No, no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not ready for that. I've already started to sense the tenseness between my wife and her and she's only seven seven about what about <laughs> what clothes she's gonna wear for the day so this is this is gonna be really really fun when teenage starts to come into play it's Aaron, gonna be great. Aaron, let me help you now i told my little girl whenever she was uh probably from about five years old on that if a boy's lips are moving he's lying <laughs> everything well that- i've got her convinced that she wants to be a stay-at-home daughter She's still going to work, <laughs> but she's going to be a stay at home daughter. She's like, well, how does that work? And I said, well, baby girl, like you're going to live with mom and dad. And then that's fine. <laughs> like, that's fine. You just go to work like I do during the day and come home and we'll be the happiest three people we'll ever see. <laughs> that's the best. I'm going to try that tonight. <laughs> stay at home daughter. <laughs> I'm going to have to have a talk with her. She doesn't need to get a job. I mean. Why would you just stay at home? Don't don't work. Got dad working. Dad, make dad work. I don't need that negativity in my life, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh shoot! Oh good. I guess That's we a... need to talk about something about podcast. Yeah. Anything <laughs> going on in the grain markets? Yeah, grain go. <laughs> <laughs> grain go. Um, <laughs> So, you know, as far as kind of like a timestamp, you know, we're on the uh, Wednesday, the 18th, September, last Thursday on the 12th, um, we had the September WASD report come out. So world agriculture supply demand exports that whole nine yards. Um, Typically, September 
in my opinion, it's not a big thing. Everyone's eyes are on August, you know, pre harvest for most of us in the corn belt. Um, so we digested that September came around most of the trade, the trade estimates, uh, anybody that's got money in it, thinking about trying to guess which way this thing's going to go. They thought the corn yield would probably be dropped a little bit. Um, and they thought the bean yield would be upped. Well, they were wrong on both accounts. So the corn yield got up to half a bushel. So instead of 183.1, now they're projecting 183.6. So a record yield. Um, wow. The bean bushel, yeah. So the, the bean bushel, they, they, they held solid at 53.2, um, which I think was probably the right thing. You know, if I'm going to say my own opinion on this, I would have held the bean yield there. We did not finish in August well at all for bean yields. Um, we had, for our little area around here, we had a huge, huge potential for beans um, all the way through July, first week of August, and then it's just like it just kept getting away from us, and we could never catch that last rain to truly finish out the bean size. And right now we're seeing small beans come in and dry, super dry. So the early planted beans, I don't think anyone's upset with the yields here in pretty good yields, uh, or at least the comments have been, they're doing good. They're, they're, they're doing well. It's these later planted, that second planting window that we struggled with, uh, this spring, uh, that'll be interesting on the bean front. But so that's what the report said, yield up for corn, um, uh, hold steady on the bean front. So that shouldn't have you know, the up in the yield on corn should have devastated this corn market, in my opinion, you know, to go from a record to an even higher record, that should have been a nail in the coffin. Well, it shrugged it off for the most part. And a lot of that was due to what they adjusted on the old crop. So last several podcasts, we've talked about how yeah. much old corn is still left out there. Well, they took to, for benefit for us, they took 55 million off of that. They said that we used it, uh, whether that was ethanol, grind, we used about 55 million bushels more. So that means our beginning stocks for this 24, 25 crop is smaller. Um, so even though we saw a bump in yield ending stocks for corn, it actually went down 17 million. Um, so the bump in production, but the offset of the old crop netted a 17 million bushel decrease in the ending stocks. We're still over 2 billion bushel ending stocks potential for 24-25. That's, it's not a good number to be at, but this was good news in a bad situation, kind of. Um, so stocks to use rate for corn, everyone knows I'm big on that. That kind of tells us how much we have left over. It's an easy number to look at real quick to see how we compare to previous years. Um, we're at 13 and three quarter percent. You know, we've not seen that since 19, since the 2019, 2020 crop. So it is an over, overly burdensome situation with corn on the bean front, <clears throat> because they held the yield, they did make a adjustment, um, to the ending stocks on it. And I think it was due to the old crop as well. They lowered it 10 million bushels. Um, ending stocks are still up at that 550 million bushel left over with a stock to use rate of 12 and a half percent. Again, the last time we had that was 1920. So these years are shaping up to be very similar <clears throat> as far as numbers go on the stocks to use rate as the 2019 rolled into 2020 uh, type of year. As far as Indiana goes, uh, Jury's still out, still have a long way to go on harvest. Uh, we're, we're tiptoeing into it now, uh, picking up speed every single day. But Indiana, they're projecting at 210 bushels the acre. That's three bushels higher than the August report. Uh, for reference, 203 was last year. So beans, 63 bushels the acre. That's two bushels more than what they projected in August, 61 last year. So we're... We're projecting another big crop. That's the amazing difference numbers. this year. Yeah, I mean they're amazing numbers, and if we truly hit those, these varieties and this these crops are way more resilient to late summer heat than we thought they were, because this is two years in a row where we've been dry towards the tail end, and we still finish strong. That 
Jury's yeah, out. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I can't imagine what the yields would be. That has to tell us something. Yeah, I can't imagine what the yields would be if it actually rained all summer. Yeah, we would have been in a really bad spot. I mean, really bad spot with the amount of old crop still out there or was still out there and new crop with the potential that we've got, or like you said, Jeff, if we had gotten the perfect weather conditions, like we kind of did last year where we just spoon fed it, I have no idea what this thing could have been. Uh, so we'll see that the, the scary part was old crop was still making probably a 50, 50 ratio for uh, old crop corn and new crop corn coming into facilities up until about last week. That's the scary part mm. was that we still had old crop coming in. September usually gives you a premium for new crop <clears throat> because the end users are usually ready for that or the feeders are ready for that new corn. There's so much old corn out there that, that there was no premium. They they had more than they needed. So they were they're actually discounting it strongly compared to new crop. So it's a weird year. Yeah. What um heard a lot of the growers complaining um a lot of the problems with the basis. Kind mm -hmm. of ex explain that for the listeners. I yeah. know you've got a good, uh, how you explain it's pretty neat with, you know, kind of how your definition is. Yeah. So if you looked up basis, you know, the, I, I don't know if I'd say it, the Webster dictionary, uh, Let's do the Bledsoe, explanation for the, it. Bledsoe yeah. dictionary. <laughs> but basis is the difference of the cash price versus the futures price. So that could either be a positive basis or a negative basis. Um, so, you know, in fall, you in this corn belt area, you usually see a negative basis. So what's that saying is that the December futures are trading at X, let's say 411. And I've got a 11 under basis. That means my facility would be paying $4 for that bushel. So that's what basis is. Now what basis does is it moves it tries to move products from where it is to where it isn't. And it is a form of that. Now, as you start to flood the pipeline and as a facility gets tighter and tighter in space or is starting to run out of avenues of getting rid of it, that basis will get worse. H however you want to say it, weaken, get, you know, get wider, whatever, however you want to say it, that number, your cash price goes down further and further as that facility struggles to handle the bushels coming in. So, so as far as what they're complaining about or it, it, the situation, like I said, usually you have a September premium. And when I say premium, I don't mean like the, I, what I'm saying by that is that the basis in September is better than what it would be for like an October delivery. So instead of like an October October or an all fall bid of like a 30 under September, you could see a 15 or 20 under because they're trying to, get, especially if that first half set, the feeders and end users are trying to get that first push of bushels to kind of get primed and going because they, they there's that window of time where usually old crop starts to fizzle out and you're waiting on new crop. That's that transition period. They usually pay up for something this year. They were not. And we're seeing basis values early in the season that I've not seen before, ever. I mean, we're, we're there's some locations that are 20 to 30 cents less than what a normal or average harvest basis would be. And we haven't even hit our stride yet. So that's where the concern is um, with the basis is, what does this truly end up looking like when everybody starts going and the pipeline starts to get its fill? What does that look like? And if a grower doesn't have storage, he's at the mercy. Of he will be at the mercy. That's why we've been big on if you know you have to move stuff, getting ahead of the storm is the best way to do it. So that's where these structured market plans come in like the average pricing tools the targets the the working in the spring and summer months of trying to get ready for fall um, at least throwing something at the board and seeing if it gets hit while you're out there doing you know spraying um, you know whatever you may be doing in the field you've got something working on the backside trying to see if it, it'll hit um, so. what what kind of tools do you have in your your toolbox to help a to help a a grower out that uh, maybe he sold some corn 
and and he listened to you, but he's now he's got a little bigger crop. Now he's got some more to sell. You know, what kind of advice do you give to that guy today, and what kind of tools can you help him work through? <clears throat> so, what I would start with is that it's kind of the same thing as what we've been saying all along. I'd rather I'd rather be proactive right now than kicking that can down the road. So, right now we've got a couple different options. Um, you can do like a basis contract because if we think basis is going to get worse as bushels keep coming in and coming in and pushing the pre putting pressure on it, you know, you could look at locking in a basis and what you're doing, what you're saying to everyone else when you do that is that I think basis could get worse, but I want to see what the futures can do. So you've locked the basis in, let's say you locked it in at a 50 under the December. Okay. You, you've locked that in. If the basis goes to 70, doesn't matter. You've got 50 locked in when you go to price it. Now, where you're open is on the future side. So if the futures, the futures, you can keep flowing that. So whatever the CME is doing, if the December corn futures rallies 20 cents, guess what? You can participate in that. You've got the, you've got the 20 cents. Uh, but if it goes down 20 cents, you've also, you're also going to experience that hit. Hmm. Um, you've only locked one piece of the puzzle in. This is a two piece puzzle between basis and futures, and they've got to be tied together at some point. The other one would be um, DP or uh, delayed pricing, uh, storage. Uh, everyone's got different terminologies for it. All it is is that you're, you're dropping it at somewhere. You no longer own it but you haven't priced it yet. And typically in these types of markets, you're paying an upfront fee to get to the first of the year and then a set fee every month after that. So that is an option. If you do that, what you're saying is between the basis and the futures, you're saying both or one of them is going to rally enough to offset the fee that you're paying up front. And so with you're, these, you're not completely kicking the can down the road, but you kind of are. Yeah. Yeah. You, what you've done there is you've at least unloaded it. Uh, it's not out in the field. You've at least done something. You've physically done something with it. You've, but yes, you, you have kicked the can on far as pricing, but, but you've at least gotten it, put it, found a home for it. Sure. Um, so the, the other option would be, um, just price, you know, doing a contract now, knowing that you're probably not ready to deliver it until two or three weeks before everybody else is delivering at the same time. So if you do that, um, you're looking at the price and you're saying, I'm okay with that price, or I think basis and futures could get worse, or I think one's going to get worse enough that it offsets whatever the other one could do. You're just saying, I can work from here. I know my situation at this point. So if you know you need to move another 5,000 bushels in fall and you lock it in right now for now until the end of November for an all fall type bid, you at least know your situation on those 5,000 bushels, wherever those 5,000 come from, you know, whether that's field one, two, and three or field one, you can do your math on that. Then at that point and know, okay, that field, this is my, profit or my, I've limited my losses on that particular field. Hmm. So I, I, we've heard a lot of uh, stories about corn that's coming in and, and beans that uh, they're, they're, they've really dried down fast this year. What are some of the moisture levels that you've seen and, and, and have you seen the speed of this, you know, dry down in, in your uh, facility? Yeah. So beans, <laughs> we were, we were joking that, I mean, oh my gosh, why are they bringing me wet beans? That's, that's 12, one. Oh, <laughs> so um, there's a lot of these beans that are in that eight to eight to 11%. Uh, when we get above 11, it's like, oh my gosh, like, where did you find those? Wow. Now there, there are some later planted beans um, that they haven't tiptoed into yet. And uh, the top's super dry, the bottom saw some butter beans. So I, I think we're starting to see a little bit of a let up on on the beans. They're getting out of the early stuff. They're waiting a couple of days before they get into the second planting window <clears throat> that they had. Corn, man, I, <laughs> straight out of the field, 13 to 15s. Wow. 
on this on this early planting stuff. Um, we finally saw some wetter corn uh, just yesterday and today, but I can tell you, ninety percent of what I've seen on new crop coming in, way drier than what everybody thought it was. What's the driest you've heard? I have. I think I heard a twelve seven on new crop, and that was irrigated corn. Wow. Now the yields are holding there, right, so I, that's the crazy part. The yields are uh, are definitely there on this early crop corn or on this early planted first window that we had. The yields are there from what I'm hearing. Um, not hearing any firm numbers, which is typical. I mean, I, I, I don't need to know firm numbers, nor do I, but better than expected, better than last year are terms that I've heard. Well, it's a good year to have it, right? I mean, yes. You yeah. don't need it at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you definitely don't want to be the person that had bad production in this type of market. Yep. So what What about uh, construction projects? I th- think you're trying to work on a little more storage. Yeah. yeah. Aaron does know how yeah, to spend so, money. <laughs> Invest. <laughs> Invest. I'm sorry. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Make I'm investing in the membership, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> He's practiced that. Yes. <laughs> no yeah I, so i started to get really giddy last week i've been sweating bullets still sweating bullets um but we have the bin crew here now um and they are they're i don't know how many sheets they've got on one of my bean bins now so they're making progress they are here to stay until the job is done now wow. so but yeah we're adding about 560 570 000, um, for corn and beans here so this will, it'll be good. I know Jason up at our Columbus facility, he said his bin crews were there uh, th- this week. So we should get this stuff online, uh, hopefully just in the nick of time. That way no one's shut down. I was going to ask you that. I think you're going to have it. You'll, <laughs> you'll be able to get it in. Can you get it out? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I'll have the space to fill it <laughs> for, for fall. Uh, but I've got plenty of other bins that I can unload and create more space in if I fill those. So we, right now it feels good. Right good. now it feels good. Um, I wish I could see them up and, or much closer to finished. Uh, Cause there's always, there can always be delays, but right now it, it feels good um, to, to see them going up. Awesome. I, I think we, we've had some things shake up in our, uh, little neck of the woods over on the west side of the territory with some uh, facilities not open like they have been in years past. So I think we've definitely done the right thing for the membership of, of adding some space. And, and the river's not in the best of shapes. Jeff would know more than I do on that front, but it feels like we're okay, but it could not be okay. Is that how you would put it, Jeff? Yeah, we could uh, we could use some more water. They're starting to uh, run out of water on the lower Mississippi, so we're starting to see some some uh, of the toe size or the, uh, toe is when they they you know lash a lot of these barges together. So they're having to uh, uh, narrow those toes up. So now like the the widest they can go through certain sections of the river are five wide, where normally I think they go six or seven wide. So hmm. you just you start to have to reduce the toe size a little bit. Uh, they can't load them quite as heavy um, to you know meet with the draft numbers and stuff. So yeah, we could use we could use some rains all over, but um, we're not uh, we haven't hit real critical stage yet. Uh, I think last year's dry weather, we did a lot of dredging on the river. That's helped. So, uh, so far, so good. But uh, rain is needed. Heavy rains up north would be great. Not for their harvest, but uh, for our river. We kid, we, uh, we kid Aaron about spending money. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's done a really nice job at Lagodi and, and, and experienced a lot of growth. And, and it seems like every time we, you know, you, you stop in at Lagodi, they've got a bin project going on. So yeah, we're always kidding him about all he does is spend money, but uh, he's actually growing that green business and doing a nice job. You'll have some new customers coming in there this year. Probably. We just saw a new one uh, just a couple hours ago. Good. So even though some facilities are, you know, not online like they used to be, we're, we're trying to pick up the slack. Good deal. Well, it's a good facility. I, I my office is in that facility, and I, I get to see the trucks come in and out. And I was like, how, "How you can unload a truck extremely fast? 
and you know, you, several trucks roll in and, and I see them roll out just about as quick. So how long does it take you to unload a truck at our Lagoti facility? So it's been a couple of years since I've updated it, but we are consistently under 10 minutes and that's year round. So that that's scale even in, scale out. Day, that's scale in, scale out. Wow. That's you on the scale, you off the scale with a ticket in your hand. Um, I, I get phone calls but like, well, what are the lines like? I, we, we don't have lines. <laughs> we just <laughs> we just move them in and out. And so something broke. Yeah. Something went wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or everybody showed up at the same time. But on, on average, we are we're, we're ten minutes or less. That's and awesome. that you know, like I said, average. That, that's including those days where it's rainy and guys want to stand around and talk out at the pit before pulling up. That's even counting when you get 10 trucks of all the same product lined up at once. We're, we're still averaging under 10. Um, yeah, usually so a, we've tried to make it easy on everybody. Um, yeah, usually a line there is when they've unloaded, they've already got their scale ticket and they're parked over to the side and talking before they leave. Yeah. <laughs> He's so we, fast, hey, we don't we even get to make good it fun gossip. And hang around. That's right. It's hard to get good gossip <laughs> if you don't have long lines and, and guys bringing gossip in. So. <laughs> Yeah. At, at some point this fall, we're probably going to, you know, maybe move a grill out there and try to feed everybody as they come through. So, oh, that, that would be good. I just know good. what day that is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You heard it here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> On the, you have 18,000 people. <laughs> All right. Well, Aaron, that's I I don't know. Do you have anything else, Jeff? No, I think that's uh that's been good. Uh, you know, um, it's, uh, it's exciting to see all those, you know, projects going on and, uh, we're, we're growing our grain business and, uh, I think it, it's good. All right. Well, Aaron, thanks for all you do. And, uh, let us know when you get that grill hooked up. We'll do. All right. Thank you guys. All right. That, see you, Aaron. <laughs> that's another episode of the high ground powered by premier companies. Please like and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you.